unmute. Can everybody hear me okay, finally? Hello, Vish, Mohit, Ted. Howdy. Happy, whatever today is, Tuesday, I guess. <laughs> it is. Okay, so I think I wanted to start off today with, let's see, share, no, not this tab, this tab. Is this a screen share working right now? It is. Can see the CNCF rubric. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I want to start off, um, just let uh, Vish, uh, if you want to give an introduction, kind of talk about what you're working on, um, since it's really particularly relevant to what we're doing here. Yeah, um, hello all. So I'm Vish. I am uh, almost final year PhD student at Emory. So I've been working with uh, observability data management as a, as a whole. So sort of where my research started was figuring out how to store distributed traces because right now most of the solutions use like SQL or some database so you convert the traces into SQL which is rows so what's inherently graphs becomes like columnar format and then you reconstruct the graphs during query time which just kind of seemed uh, inefficient but uh, eventually, we felt like that problem was too big, so we moved into query languages because, like you guys already know, it, it's pretty much non-standardized. And then LLMs came along, so GPT-2 and a bunch of other LLMs came along, and one of the ideas that we had was um, right now, almost all the platforms treat metrics and logs kind of same, so... Uh, but logs inherently require text search and metrics are more like, you know, uh, a numerical aggregation or sum or, or whatever. So, uh, so our idea was we split the two and we treat them completely separately. So metrics, you can use SQL or like any of these columnar stuff that Honeycomb's been talking about or any of the other solutions. But when it comes to logs specifically, uh, we treat logs as a text search. So I've mostly been building tools around using natural language as a direct uh, query mechanism. Uh, one of the early versions of my work, we we couldn't get it to uh, do these time-based queries, which was almost all of the queries that were run at log scale. So uh, that is where I'm essentially working on a query planner layer in between. But at the same time, we are also looking at the converting natural language into some intermediate uh, query language expression, which is LockQL for now, but it could pretty much be anything. Yeah. Oh, so you are doing the intermediate language you're thinking of? Yeah, so we already did it. Uh, so we created the natural language to LockQL data set. Mm -hmm. So one of the things is, one is LockQL is open source, <clears throat> but the bigger thing with Lock, why we chose LockQL was Grafana dashboards are open source. So you could go to Grafana's website and grab a lot of these community dashboards, which helped us with writing the with creating the data set. Like almost none of the other languages have such publicly available dashboards for the logs that we had. So there is this log data set called a log hub, which has almost 15 different applications, out of which we found three applications, OpenStack, OpenSSH, and um, uh, and HDFS, all three of which had LockQL, da sorry, Grafana dashboard available. So we, we created the data set and we have fine-tuned a few models right now. So uh, we fine-tuned GPT-40, we are fine-tuning a Llama and a bunch of other smaller models to see how the performance uh, compares to something like GPT-40. Cool. 
Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. The, for the actual, the direct to data model yeah. that you're working on that you know, yeah. code base, how feasible is that? I mean, do you think, do you have to train the model on the entire corpus of log data? No. Or how would you so, train sample? Yeah. So the idea behind that specific project was we enable, we don't just enable search, we enable semantic search. So one of the problems with logs that we that like even Microsoft, one of Microsoft paper talked about and what we uh, found when we talked to a bunch of developers was a lot of people use uh, like similar words to mean the same sort of thing. So, you know, password accepted, password authenticated, both are the same thing, but they're, uh, one search will not give you the other result and vice versa. So essentially the idea that we are working on is we split the two parts of a log. So any log typically contains your metadata, which is your timestamp, what's the region it was running, what's like in 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 LockQL world, there would be the Prometheus tags. And then there is this actual text. So what we converted, so we built mini embedding models for the corpus of vocabulary that it can probably see on these logs and then we use that to generate embeddings for for the for each of the the text part of it and when we are running the search we get a query we parse out the we we build a query planner layer which is what i'm i'm doing right now and we we sort of split the query into what is the metadata and what is the actual query intent so we use the metadata to query, uh, like if you use QDRINT or any other vector or similarity search, you can add filters to it where it will go through a bunch of filters to run the cosine similarity or whatever distance metric you want to use and retrieve those specific log lines and, and show it to the user. So at this point, you could always like have a re-ranker module that like ranks the query uh, uh, retrieved content more specific to what the user wants and, and stuff. But those are just like some enhancements you can do. The base of it is coming up with an embedding model that has a knowledge of the vocabulary of your uh, application. For example, it should know config ID and configuration ID mean the same thing, like mm -hmm. log differently. So that is where the big challenge is. Gotcha. And then for a practicality reason, would it work then, do you think, if you're on ingest, you're creating those vectors for every log line so that you can do the match? Yeah, like that is pretty much what, uh, for example, Amazon's been doing that for uh, a lot of their product search internally. So mm -hmm. they have like these huge graph uh, similarity search mechanisms internally and like you google pretty much any company you take today has already done it for non-observability domain so mm -hmm. scaling these vector databases or like the similarity search or any of that is is in a sense like a known engineering problem uh, but in terms of whether it would be cost effective is not an answer I can give you. So, yeah. <laughs> because uh, honestly, I have not done that kind of analysis and yeah. Yeah, uh, because in the observability realm, you do wind up with a problem yeah. that you have a lot of data coming in really fast and it may be larger than the data sets that the products are actually working on. But yeah. Yeah, that'd yeah. be interesting though. It, yeah, it's fascinating work there. So, cool. Yeah, and then, um, yeah, thanks for attending and uh, being willing to help out. And any particular areas of interest with the working group that you're interested in focusing on? Um, so I went through some of the documents on the GitHub uh, folder. I think I, I was specifically interested in maybe running a bunch of these developer interviews to see, like, I, I saw that there was already a set of interviews that was conducted with the DSL designers. I would like to probably help out with conducting interviews for the DSL users yep. to kind of see like, you know, what, what they, because that is sort of what I've been doing as well with like, I've been mostly talking to people who use these tools because uh, yeah, if, if that, that, yeah, I didn't really want to end up building another query language.
Yep. <laughs> kind of the same thing everybody else says too. Um, yeah. But yeah. <laughs> and be nice to have a uniform standard. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we can kind of get there eventually. We'll see. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thanks. Anybody else have questions for Ish? Cool. Um, then yeah, for everybody who's joined, please uh, you have to sign in to the uh, meeting notes here. So I'll stick that. And then, yeah, we are kind of winding down, like Vishy, you mentioned the um, developer interviews. I think we should hopefully have the Google team, observability team next meeting presenting on Zeta SQL. Um, and so we'll chat with them about that, about the piped uh, SQL standard that I'm kind of excited about because, yeah, SQL pain the butt for observability data for time series data but it really has eaten the world and everybody tries to you know create some new language to replace it but nobody's succeeded universally um so i'm thinking and then the rate that it's developing like adding the um in the standards committee the graph uh, querying capabilities and um i was trying to get the ros Rostamon folks to present too about array and data queue processing capabilities in the SQL standard. Now, I think it's still a pretty good fit, uh, pretty darn useful potentially. Um, so since we've kind of wrapped up some of the designer interviews, I wanted to start with the uh, getting a document together to discuss what kind of features we should try to implement in a standard what anybody wants so this ties in again uh, with interviewing all of the end users so i need to cross post this in the hotel end users group there and then Vish, of course if you know folks you want to ask and anybody else who wants to go back to their teams um of course mohead and i are on the same team so we can ask people <laughs> but uh ted zach or anybody who wants to and anybody listening to this um after the video is posted um we need more information here um so I wanted to start off with the, uh, so we created this rubric where we went through a bunch of the different languages, compiled some of the major features, not every single little one. We didn't go deep in the semantics yet, but we want to get an overview of what features overall folks want to support. Um, and as folks are going through this document, we wanted everybody to think about the various considerations that you have to account for when we're looking at languages. So first should be, of course, satisfying the typical observability use cases that we've already captured in the document there uh, from simple things like aggregating your metrics, um, selecting and filtering through logs and um, observing or calculating um, the longest span at a trace, that kind of information. Um, the language should, at the very least, of course, support querying the data, so we need those predicates. But we also want some basic analytics, because otherwise it's pretty useless, right? In Prometheus, you've got all your um, grouping and time selecting and consolidation or down sampling, etc. Um, so we need at least some basics there. Uh, the big open question in our industry is how far we want to go down that analytics um, roadmap. If we want to make it so that people can do almost all of their evaluation within the language, or if we just want to do some basics and then have folks export it to a data frames um, platform, uh, for example, we need to figure that out. Now, of course, we have to support OTEL telemetry models um, as well, likely as some others, I'm guessing, for at least metrics. Um, we need to get those in. Uh, we, of course, want to make sure it has first-class support for time-based operations. That's where, you know, SQL, for example, is kind of lacking. You have to shim that in, and it's kind of messy. Um, but things like uh, LogQL or PromQL make those assumptions implicit and make it a lot simpler to write a query and get some useful information. Um, then again, yeah, this one's kind of tied up there. I should edit that. Um, then another one is uh, pretty important, I think, that we need to evaluate in that observability data is no longer a um, unique isolated use case. Um, it's more and more tied in with BI data, um, where the BI and data science engineers want to 
be able to query and join observability data with other metrics like cost metrics or security data, et cetera. So we are just another data set. We're no longer so uh, snowflake that we can sit in our little ball gardens, I don't think. Um, support a syntax that users would accept. Nobody's going to love a <laughs> final syntax. That's tons of bike shedding that can happen there. Um, so I just got to figure out something that people would like. It does, after evaluating all designers and languages out there, seem like everybody likes a pipe language. So I'm cool with that personally. I like pipes. Um, we also need to evaluate, and this is going back to our original charter, um, the ease of providing support for tooling because people want syntax highlighting, auto completion, all of that is a big help for anybody using the language. Uh, so make sure to account for that. Uh, we need support discoverability where users might be in the middle of an incident and they're trying to edit a query to find the data that's going to show them the root cause of something uh, that's going wrong. So a lot of time with the queries when everybody talks about how we need a simple, effective query language like PromQL or something. Um, the reason they say that is because it's easy to just tweak it really quick, add a group by or add a, a filter and redraw the graphs and you see the kind of data that you're looking for. And it's really easy to observe. Instead of editing a huge SQL file where you have to change the group by in four or five different places, you know, if you want to add an extra tag, that's a pain in the neck. So we do want to make it fast to work with. Um, another concern is executing the same query for at rest data versus streaming data, because at scale, it's really difficult to do alerting off of a query model. So we need to support that. But at the same time, ideally, you'd like to be able to take the same query and execute it against your at rest data and your streaming data and get pretty much the same result back. Um, another thing to think about is composability or templating your queries, since like the Grafana dashboards Fish mentioned, you typically have some templates where you can then plop in your various tags um, or drop them and edit it, or you can change the time and the time range selector, and you don't actually have to edit the query itself. So we're gonna make sure that's useful. And then uh, I started kind of capturing the different consumers of the data or the user personas. So we have everything from leadership and executives who are just looking at pre-canned queries for reports, and they never actually touch the query language. Then we have non-domain experts um, that use UIs to kind of explore or edit the data. That's a really common use case, and most users really hate dealing with query languages. So, I mean, part of our work here is moot in that sense, and that if you just build a UI where people can edit it and create the query, doesn't matter if you have uh, natural language or query language behind it, whatever. It's just a bunch of little widgets that people are clicking around. That's the question. But then you also can't design a UI that's going to incorporate all of those features and make it you know, easy to use. Uh, you take a look at Scuba's UI um, over at Facebook, and it has all the features under the sun, but you have to scroll through lots of menus to find the proper function, and it is a lot of work, so you do have to become something of an expert on that. So again, non-domain experts are pretty important. Then you get, uh, again, have the SREs or the folks looking for useful data during an incident, so they have to be able to know the query language pretty quickly. It has to be fairly simple, and they have to be able to use it in anger to <laughs> find and fix things. Um, then again, you also have the data engineers who may not be super familiar with the data, but they're pretty darn good at querying data and joining it. Uh, so they want to look at your observability data and tie it and join it with BI data. Um, that's kind of the reason that Facebook and uh, Google are both going in the direction of a unified data language, not observability, but because they can then query and federate all of the data regardless of where it is, and anybody who needs it can get to it. So I think that's going to be, uh, personally, I think that's uh, going to be a driving theme in the observability industry going forward, too. Um, then, of course, you have the subject matter experts um, using language um, to create really complex queries and derive insights that are difficult to do in other ways. And then you have the um, 
power users, of course, who are just going to use it to do something like uh, generate PNGs, um, like the Netflix logo and Atlas stack language, which is kind of cool. But some uh, SRE had the time to do, <laughs> which is always amazing to me. Um, so any questions on kind of these considerations or anything that we've missed that you think should be included? And of course, if anybody has any thoughts going in the future, please add comments to this doc. I linked it in the chat here. It's also in the CNCF Slack. I'll send out a notice to the emailing list too. Um, but always jump in any thoughts or comments uh, or questions. We're always happy to have them. <clears throat> so getting into kind of the um, data types um, that we came up with initially here. Uh, to support uh, the format here, as you can see, we added check marks or little uh, emojis to distinguish whether or not we definitely should support something, we don't need to support something, or it's still an open question, which is a little blue question mark here. So um, the data types that we want to support here. Um, I took these initially from SQL and then added some other things like the histograms, exponential histograms, et cetera. I think for the most part, this should be non-controversial. We should support signed integers, unsigned integers. Uh, one thing, do we want to distinguish between single precision, double precision uh, floating points in an observability language? I don't think personally we need to um, because the majority of metrics when stored are stored as um, double precision float. And that's been fine for the most part. There are some edge cases where um, I think Prometheus supports it now. I'm not totally sure. I know Influx does where they support, uh, you know, 128 bit unsigned counters. Um, so we do need to support that at least 64 bits. We can discuss 128 bits going forward. Um, and then decimal, again, we're not dealing with uh, financial data in general. And if somebody does put it in an uh, observability system, they're just looking for ranges. They're not looking for absolute values um, of bank accounts and whatnot. They may be looking at, like at Yahoo, we had ad revenue in the observability system. They just want to know, well, if it drops from, you know, the millions down to the thousands in a minute, then some system went pear-shaped. So we need to alert on that. And that's fine. Um, Boolean values, of course, since we're dealing with alerting, we're going to want to be able to convert anything into a Boolean at the end as a signal for an alert engine. One big question is whether or not we want to support a byte data type. Um, the reason is that the LTEL standard does support um, binary data in the log format. And there are some use cases where you may want to extract some log data as binary values and be able to manipulate that and then maybe convert it into strings or other types of data. Um, so I'm personally kind of on the fence about that one. Um, date time type should go without saying, since we're dealing with time series data. Um, we need to support uh, time zones, I believe, um, being able to at least map a time zone onto that if we need to. Generally, it's going to be Unix epoch, um, you know, UTC kind of work, and then at the presentation layer, maybe add time zones. Um, but there are some use cases where you might be computing a period over period uh, difference of some kind. And you need to be able to join up and skip any changes like a daylight savings time in order to maintain relationships across time. Uh, another type is going to be a duration. Uh, so you want to look at, uh, be able to specify uh, durations or intervals like one hour, or one day, that kind of thing, and be able to apply that to your data. And then in the metric space, we don't support nulls. We don't need them. But in the logging area, uh, we definitely do. Potentially in tracing, too. Um, maybe in profiling. Not totally sure there. So I'm thinking we'll have to go through uh, uh, recommend the language support 3VL. Um, and then, of course, we need histogram, exponential histogram support uh, as primitive types as well. Um, so any thoughts around these data types here? Anything controversial or interesting? Um, 
pretty straightforward. Cool. Um, and then I put these outside here. Um, there are a couple of questions I had for folks who want to chime in too. One of them would be character and binary strings. Um, so we do, of course, uh, via logs and tags or attributes. In Hotel uh, Lingua, we have to support uh, strings, of course. So we have to be able to match on those. We have to do regex, all that kind of stuff in the predicate section. Um, do we need to support multiple character sets, or do we just need to be able to stick with ASCII and Unicode? Does everybody think UTF-8? I think in observability, these are enough. We don't need to go down the SQL rabbit hole of supporting all kinds of um, character mappings, et cetera. I think we'd be okay there. Any thoughts? Um, only question is, uh, does does that come with uh, like multi-language support uh, or? Yeah, I believe it would because you can, you know, incorporate all of the um, the various language characters in the UTFA. Um, so you should be able to support all those. The question would be, it's kind of like legacy encodings that aren't very common nowadays, but maybe in, you know, the old COBOL languages and whatnot that the SQL standard still has to support. Yeah, um, that makes which sense. is another, yeah, makes yeah, sense. Thank you. Cool, sure. And then another question again would be the byte sequences. I think we may need to support this again um, for extracting some binary data from logs, if possible. Um, so again, the big question there would be how should we handle binary strings and logs? I think uh, like VJ, if he was here, he would say, um, yeah, we don't need to worry about it initially because um, that's probably a very edge use case that not many people are hitting. So we should focus on the other data types and maybe shim this in later on if people, if we come up with a good standard and actually gets adopted. Um, so that's kind of what I'm leaning towards, but if people want to comment on there, that'd be great. Um, cool. Then the other kind of another type that we need to deal with um, in observability, of course, are arrays, maps, and lists. For collections, I think those are the only ones that we really need to worry about in our use cases, uh, day in, day in, because uh, they there. Um, another question will be if we need multi-set or not. Uh, another question is if we allow nesting of these collections, or if we uh, only enable uh, primitives for the collection values. And then... Also, do we want to support multi-dimensional arrays and actually go down the OLAP cube route? Um, so those are questions that I have still. Anybody have thoughts on those? I think you have to support nesting if you're going to do JSON. Yep. People have JSON blobs. OK. Good point. I'll make a note there. It's, it sucks, but it's reality. Yeah. Yep, <laughs> you're right. Cool. Yeah, and feel free to leave a comment on there too, uh, too Ted, if you want. Um, I think the biggest controversial thing would be whether or not you allow uh, user-defined types in the language. Um, I think we probably will have to. And I think we might define some standards around that, particularly when you're working with um, things like sketches or digests or histograms that are not part of the hotel standard right now that are widely used. Um, because at scale, you're going to have a lot of systems where you're accounting the um, taking a digest and just getting approximate values with known error bounds. Um, so I think there are ways that we need to shim that in. That's probably the best way to do that would be UDFs because we don't want to go chasing all the latest formats that are out there in the future. And while that does sacrifice uh, sacrifice some uh, portability, at least it narrows the domain of um, uh, failures in port porting the data um, or the queries between different systems. And then... Yeah, what do you think, uh, Ted, about supporting JSON? Anybody else think we need to support JSON as a standard for parsing? I th think we should. What? I mean, may not be for all the telemetry types, but yeah, I agree for logs, 
it's really a good data type. Yep, definitely for logs. There is, I think, the capability of using it for um, attributes as well, particularly in traces. I think some people have dropped um, JSON data in a trace uh, attribute, and they want to parse that out, even though it's better to try to get them to you know, properly break it out and populate the attributes directly. Um, but yeah, definitely JSON. Any votes for supporting XML? No. <laughs> No, I didn't think so. <laughs> Another question would be whether or not we need to support enumerations in a language, if it's of use or not. I'm kind of leaning no, at least initially, but I want to see if anybody has thoughts on that. No. Cool. Then the next section here would be uh, predicates. So you can't really have a database system without being able to pick the data out that you want to work with. So uh, the first ones, hopefully here, are totally non-controversial. Um, the standard uh, comparison predicates, your equals, not equals, less than, greater than, less than equals, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think the other one is that if we go through the three VL route and we look at nulls, we need to have the uh, null check um, in there. And then I think it's also useful, particularly as we get around uh, logging data, where we may be doing a lot of type casting from strings to numbers or other data types, or JSON uh, particularly, um, for parsing that, that we have a type check in there as well. So we can say, yeah, is this type of list um, hopefully we could even get into the, you know, types of data within the list, et cetera. Um, and then another question here would be if we need to implement any kind of overrides for, uh, less and greater than, et cetera, for collections. And that gets really confusing and messy and I think we'd leave it out. But any other comparison thoughts that folks have here for the basic comparison? Um, the another one would be uh, conditional queries for substitutions. I'm actually not even sure why I put this in here. Oh, yes, like a ternary operator. <clears throat> so I think this is um, really important. It comes up a lot. Uh, whenever I've seen people querying observability data where they want to be able to say, okay, I want to write a predicate that says, if this value is within this range, uh, substitute that um, something else. Or if it's not within that range, then give me uh, another value. So I don't know if we want to go down the full Turing complete rabbit hole of introducing branching and um, uh, loops and whatnot. I think we're trying to avoid that as much as we can, but a simple conditional like this may be useful. So I'm wondering if anybody has thoughts on that. Do you think it'd be I good to have? CloudWatch, CloudWatch have the similar conditional thing uh, for yeah. the metrics. Did anybody use it, do you know, very often? Yeah, I think it depends again on the data type. If it is more of a like, let's say, a health heartbeat metrics, it might be useful for converting the binary to more of a some sort of flag. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's it's might be useful for a given use case, but not broadly accepted. Cool. Uh, also, like, if uh, if we have these data types to query then I'm assuming similar data types would be used at the parsing end as well. So to parse the lo incoming logs into uh, the, the entries, we could probably add some conditionals at the parsing stage. So it's handled internally by the data type and we don't have to like worry too much about these conditional queries of substitution and stuff. It can, um, but kind of the model that a lot of 
um, at scale observability is moving to is to just ingest and store the data and then you query it at um, and manipulate it at query time. Uh, okay. um, because, so... yeah, it's tough to do the, particularly for logging, um, yeah. to capture all those potential use cases at a time. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Thank you. Sure. All right. Yeah, I'll put that, leave that as a question mark, let people think about it there. Um, and then a couple of set predicates too, um, or even more of them, I guess, would be an in and a range. So the in set, I think, is pretty straightforward. I think a lot of um, telemetry systems support that. Um, range, uh, some of them support it. Um, again, it involves kind of an implicit typecast. So that one's a little more up in the air. Uh, member, maybe, I think. Subset is probably going to be useful, particularly um, if you want to evaluate something before joining the data. Like if you want to say, I want to make sure that my attributes on both sides of a join have the same kind of um, tag keys, uh, you may want to use a subset for that. And then a set operation or predicate checking for duplicates. Um, don't know if that's useful. And then I also had... Any other predicates, like uh, do we want superset or disjoint, those kind of things in a query language? Um, any of that sound useful? Uh, maybe a little more complex than we need to get to. And some of this, I think, could definitely be left out of uh, version 1. Um, maybe added in version 2 or something. And then... Strings, I think, um, for string predicates, we do want to support a kind of a glob-like or uh, like syntax where um, I think, what did somebody say? Uh, Prom doesn't even support uh, regex <laughs> or maybe some other ones because I know regex is regular expressions are the bane of all um, database engineers because um, <laughs> it's so expensive. They do. I think uh, when, when I was writing the PromQL rebreak, I, this was one of the things I looked into, and they do have for the label values that oh, okay. can be a regular expression. Oh, great. Okay. So that's good to have. Yeah. And then, yeah, the big question around this is going to be what kind of standards do you support for regex? Because there are different libraries out there, you know, RA2 versus PCRE versus POSIX or POSIX, however you pronounce it. I mean, yeah. for for example, the Custo QL have this concept of pattern matching with keywords like has, not has, has mm -hmm. prefix, has suffix, uh, mm -hmm. contains all this, and then you just specify the specific regex. Yeah, so that avoids using the um, uh, pre uh, regex entirely, right? Mm -hmm. Because it could be both way. Uh, we really want to look for a regex, or without having this specific regex, like the negation approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, I'm kind of leaning towards, you know, I, I, I'm thinking of supporting that too. I mean, we do an ASL, right? I have the stars with ends with, et cetera, and contains. Um, and that is pretty useful uh, because that helps you avoid the regex standard and whatnot. But at the end of the day, people are going to say, I just want to slap a regex in there. <laughs> So it'd be tricky. But yeah, I think we can support the others. Um, actually, let me add that question. All right, yeah, and then see, we're about at time here, so I'm going to stop here, and then hopefully next time we'll have the uh, Google folks present. If not, we can go over more of this, and I'll share it around. Um, so yeah, any other thoughts, Mohit? And sure. that presentation is for the Zeta SQL, right? Yep. All right. Well, thank you all for 
attending and then yeah fish will catch up with you offline there too yeah i will uh so the nl to lock ql thing is almost done so i can send over so we are submitting to vltb which is like november 1st so in like the next 25 days i should pretty much have all the results and stuff so i could also present that at some point and you are also presenting to sigma fish right uh, no we are not uh, so uh, sigma deadline was is actually day after tomorrow so what happened yeah, was uh, we had this power outage here because of helene and sorry. all our fine tuning jobs got killed and then we had to wait for two days to get the data center back up and and stuff so yeah yeah anyway uh that the by data center i mean uh three rack servers under my desk <laughs> <laughs> so yeah oh. uh, i but now that that is solved uh, we 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 then decided to send that to uh, vltb instead so okay okay yeah i think i already discussed with krish also so whenever that paper is ready we can yeah. definitely help with you and provide feedback yeah oh. yeah yeah. Okay. That, it was nice meeting you, folks. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Any other thoughts? Though? I mean, we're free to talk to you if you have any questions. No, I I don't really have question. I'll go through this document. I I saw this yesterday night, and I haven't been had a chance to go through it. But it looks. And like I think a... this is this doc is still open. Uh, there are mm -hmm. still some section related to the function sections and all. If you have anything in your mind, feel free to update. Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. The, the only thing I, I wanted to see was if there was any auto data type detector that would go into this language. Because like you said, the, these are ad hoc. So you just pull the records from somewhere. So we would have to give that sort of support, like what Python does for its a, internal data types and and stuff. But mm -hmm. yeah, that is that is maybe a... Uh, a, a tangential discussion. Mm -hmm. No, it's a perfectly, it's a good valid discussion, I think, um, because yeah. I think in observability, generally we do deal with type data um, because mm -hmm. particularly in log case um, where you're evaluating uh, or trying to extract, let's say a metric from a non-structured log, um, mm -hmm. you're gonna go through and you're saying, okay, maybe I'll apply a regex or a capture predicate of some way and say, okay, I know my number appears here in this string. So extract mm -hmm. that, convert it to an integer or a double. And then at that point, you know, uh, then you can use uh, traditional metric operators to do things like dance sampling and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, but you kind of have to explicitly, and there is some implicit conversion there. Yes, I think if you look at uh, Splunk's query language. When you do that capture, it'll automatically look at it and say, okay, can I throw this into an int or a, a double mm -hmm. and then work with it there? That makes sense. Yeah, like uh, these, I, I think uh, uh, Google is releasing, will release, I don't know, they're they're releasing this thing called Zero Copy, which like does these uh, safe, uh, uh abstractions over the existing data types that that you have but uh yeah those are those are obviously for discussions down the road i guess oh cool no sensor all right okay. awesome thank you all right thank you, thanks for your time everyone catch you later